Welcome to Hollywood and Sip. I'm your host, Kat Smith. With me today is Linda Booker, who is a documentary filmmaker. Um, she was here in Sonoma Valley for the Sonoma Sonoma International Film Festival. I, for a second, couldn't remember if Valley was in there. Um, <laughs> she was here with her film, Bringing It Home, and also with Straws, which is one of the movies that impacted my life. You'll see I got my stainless steel straws <laughs> now. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> And then also we're going to talk about your newest short. So how are you? I'm good, thankfully, you know. Um, just glad that everybody's, you know, healthy here in our household and just thinking a lot, of course, about those who are a lot less fortunate this time. But yeah, it's, it's good. And I thought we could start with bringing it home because that one right now, um, right after listening to our interview, they could go find it on YouTube if they want to watch it. So um, would you like to start with bringing it home? Sure. Um, I can just tell you a little brief about it, if that's what yeah. you'd like. Um, well, bring it home is actually the creation of my friend and co filmmaker in crime, <laughs> Blair Johnson. And um, we had met back at the Center of Documentary Studies at Duke University. 2003, and then um, she had been talking up hip to me for years. Um, and finally, in 2010, I picked up a USA Today, and I saw this big headline, and this man in front of this gorgeous modern home, and the headline was, the nation's first hemp home. And it was in Asheville, North Carolina. And being North Carolinians, I was just like, wow, this is really cool. I didn't no, you could make a house out of construction materials from hemp fiber. Um, and it really got me interested. And then we kind of just went on this whirlwind journey for the next couple of years to go to Europe and film uh, hemp industry experts here in the United States, including David Bronner and Mike Bronner at Bronner's Magic Soaps, another great California company, and Nutiva. Uh, uh, John Rulak is the CEO, and they're right there in Richmond, California. So we, we really put together, I think, what was a comprehensive and entertaining and educational film about hemp for an American audience who needed this education pretty badly. <laughs> Oh yeah, for sure. I I learned it was a game changing film for me because I hadn't realized the extreme difference between hemp and marijuana plants, even though they're the same family. It's like you said at the beginning. I don't want to give away the whole history clip at the beginning, but you you show um, two cousins. One is wearing the the bandit mask, and he commits a crime. The other one doesn't, but they both get arrested for it. That's kind of that's kind of the simplest explanation you can give for the two plants. Yeah, and at that time when we made the film, um, a lot of people now say, my gosh, you guys are a little ahead of the curve because that came out in 2013. And, you know, at this time, it really was frustrating for industrial hemp advocates because there was a lot of passing of marijuana legislation for medicinal use. And yet industrial hemp, which is not a drug used for food, fiber, textiles, um, again, building, plastics, all these things, for some reason, that was meeting us more resistance uh, for trying to get our farmers to grow it here. So I'm happy to announce, of course, things have changed since then. We talk about that in the film. I kind of give everybody a little speedy update where we are now as far as how farmers can grow it in the U.S. Yeah, I like that you did that. I like that you revisited it and said, um, in this time frame, this much has happened. So that going into it, you can understand why um, why they're they're fighting the fight but you also see where we've come to now and it almost seems like you can see cbd oil products on any shelf in any store now i mean at least in california i don't know is it is it all of america that's opened up or is it still oh, yeah. a, a certain number of states i mean you can go to the gas station you know a block away from my house here and they're selling cbd i would caution anybody buying products with cbd in it to please do your research Yes. Um, right now, it's a wide open industry, really in its beginning years. And so we're working through, I mean, a lot of uh, legislation and, and regulating around FDA policies and testings and things. So just research the product um, 
and don't waste your money on something that really isn't worth it. <laughs> well, yeah, that's a very good point too, because uh, at the time that you made the film, uh, there there was a watchful eye and now it kind of seems like, well, I see it in face creams. I see it in food right. products. I see it. Um, but one of the fascinating things that you cover in the film is the building products. Um, you follow one man who, um, and actually you might see this on Twitter later. I think I tagged you in it. I might not have tagged you in it, but um, Jilly, Jimmy Fallon made fun of him because he was building a hemp house. And, <laughs> you know, that was 2013 when he, when he did that little bit. So I tweeted today and I just said, just curious. And I included the link to your film. Have you changed your thought on that since it's been seven years and all of this education is out there? So we'll see what he says. I'll let you know if he answers back. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I think, you know, as a comedian, he was making a joke about the material. And believe me, it's like you can't say the word hemp, maybe now. But, you know, when we when this film came out, every time I was telling somebody I was making a film about hemp, I got a joke back. Oh, yeah, man, I could smoke my T-shirt, you know. And, you know, Anthony Brenner, who was the designer of that first house, he had to deal with every journalist trying to make some pun or joke out of it. And I think, again, you know, I get it. You know, you want to do something that's eye-catching or makes people laugh. But in the end, you know, we were trying to get people to take this very seriously. Um, and it should be taken seriously. I mean, this is a solution uh, for a lot of major issues globally, or a part of a solution, I should say. There's no one solution. But, you know, we were trying to introduce it as how this can help with hunger, how this can help with um, climate change, how this can help with affordable, safe housing. I mean, all of these are very important issues that, um, yes, it's great to make a joke, but we want people to take this seriously. Well, and I think that's what's so important about your film, too, is that it's very easy. And it's it's sort of what's happening in the United States today with looking at who's giving us information on the virus. Are you listening to the doctors or are you look, looking to one person who might not have the correct information, right? right. Um, not naming names. But um, if, if we're only exposed to the comedians and the people who do the late night TV, I, for example, having never been a marijuana smoker, um, I didn't know there was any different. I just hear cannabis and I think it's all one big thing. So I think the education of it is really important. You were ahead of your time because now it is, you know, making this explosion. Um, I, I wanted to talk about the insulation real quick before we move to the next movie. Sure. Why, why is that um, the use of hemp in the insulation? I don't know if um, the hempcrete, is that how you say it? The concrete that's made of hemp? Um, mm -hmm. Was that the insulation or was that a separate product? So there are multiple products with hemp. Um, and, and yes, there's two different things. There's hempcrete, which is basically the hemp sheath plus lime um, and water. Uh, over time, it calcifies and makes a hard product that can actually serve as your replacement for sheetrock and insulation. So you can do an entire house with just the hempcrete product as your wall system. There is an addition to that hemp insulation, and that is then just the looser fiber that can be made into mats or bolts that can be used in between walls or ceilings or floors for insulation. And so there are companies in Europe that have those two products in addition to even the hemp boards, like hemp plywood, um, and, and also um, hemp bricks. And we talk about that in the film. I mean, there's so many different products. There's also spray hempcrete that actually um, they use in some of the Northern European countries to actually do like an insulating wrap around some of these older homes to make them, you know, more temperate. And um, so it's, there's a lot of products. And I think that's what's so exciting is there's so many products that can be made. Yeah, and, and what hit me specifically about the insulation itself though was how much healthier it was for human yeah. beings to be in a house with that for the insulation as opposed to the things that we already use. Yeah, the, the, the big impact for me was really researching and learning about the enormity of toxic materials and chemicals that are involved in most construction materials. And that building with hempcrete and using hemp products, you're using, again, a natural plant um, that is just going to filter the air, absorb carbons, be, um, create a, a thermodynamic, I'm sorry, thermal regulating atmosphere, mitigate and um, prevent mold, mildew, pest infiltration. I mean, 
it's unbelievable. And then the bottom line is people want to hear about, well, how can I save money if I use this product? And because of its insulation and our qualities, you can save from 30 to 50% on your heating and cooling bill. And here's something I think California residents really pay attention to. This is a very good on YouTube where they're holding a blowtorch for 45 minutes to hempcrete and it doesn't light. So this is something that I think as a state that can grow hemp, um, I really hope that architects and builders embrace this. And real quickly, I just want to say that I'm really thrilled there is a now a U.S. Hemp Building Association. You can certainly Google them and find them. And they are really amazing group of professionals aiming to get these products certified so that architects and builders can have this as a tool in their toolbox. Ah, oh, that's amazing. And there's... So it's not a very long documentary. It's not a lot of time to watch it. So I suggest everybody goes to watch it because while we touched on a few things here, it's, it, I don't want to say action packed because it's not an action movie, but it's got so much information in it. And it's, and it's also just really good and fun to watch. And also going into the next film, I'm going to point out that you like to do at the beginning, kind of a documentary style animation. And I yeah. just love those. And they just, they draw you into the story right away. Um, what what it's something that you must love too because you keep doing it um what draws you to that well i when i started getting into documentary film one of the things that I, even maybe a reason why some people might avoid them sometimes is that they can tend to be pretty heavy um go to any documentary film festival you're probably not going to leave joyful and elated and hopeful <laughs> that's not to say that these brilliant filmmakers um and, and important topics and, and they're all everyone should watch those but what i found i think is that people in the end really do want to be entertained a little bit and so if you can inject a little humor a little lightheartedness a little animation i think it just makes these films a little bit more palatable for an audience that maybe wouldn't watch that film otherwise. And so I've been very grateful that to work with a team of people that we kind of share the same sensibilities and, and putting together something that is fast paced, entertaining, informative, and hopefully people feel positive and inspired in the end. Oh, I think your films do that too, because you're you do cover some heavy topics, but you also, you, you kind of end with hope. And I like that. I think every meeting needs a little hope right now. Oh, definitely. Yeah. And, you know, it's hard. There's so much to be engaged in and care about and, you know, have a heavy heart about. And so, um, yeah, but we can't forget that all of these issues that started before now are ongoing and we still have to be a part of those solutions or they will get worse. So that brings us right into straws and, um, so re-watching it for our interview, because I saw it a couple of years ago when you were here for the film festival. And again, got my straw. Yay. That's um, a good one. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so one of the things that caught me this time was I realized that um, perhaps the first time I watched it, first or second time I watched it, because I watched it a couple of times, um, I was more drawn into the story about the current situation and somehow the history of the straw just completely went over my head. <laughs> and um, so today that's what caught my attention first. And um, I had not realized that straws went all the way back to ancient Mesopotamia. Like that stuff was blowing my mind. My mind was open to the history this time and I just, I could not believe it. <laughs> Yeah, you know, every time I do research for a film, it's, it's fun, you know, to, to what you find out. Um, I think that's one of the things that I find is so enjoying about the process is this discovery of, oh my God, I didn't know that, <laughs> you know, and, and if I didn't know that, well, chances are probably a lot of other people don't either. Um, so yeah, I think it's always fun to give people a little background. Well, how did human beings get so addicted to this drinking tube? <laughs> You yeah, know, right? Apparently it started a long time ago. <laughs> but I, I, like the, I like it in Egypt. I think it, it says that they, they use straws to avoid slurping up insects. You know? That's yeah. what I was going to bring up <laughs> yeah. next. Because, uh, I, I'm a big fan of taking a, a cup that closes with a straw. And it's reusable, I promise. But I'm, I'm a big fan for that very reason. When I'm camping, I don't want to slurp up the bugs. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> yeah. They're a problem. <laughs> so, 
Um, I won't give away the rest of the history though, because I, I did. I love that beginning clip. So if you watch it for no reason alone, which you have to watch the whole thing because it's an important movie, but it's that little minutes. bit of history is so <laughs> awesome. <laughs> and it's only thirty minutes. I mean, you know, yeah, it goes yeah. fast. <laughs> and again, it's short, but it's filled with so much information, and you will leave with so much more knowledge than you had going in. Um, Tim Robbins is the narrator for the beginning. How did you bring him on board? Yeah, I'm very grateful that Tim came on board and, um, you know, I was a huge admirer of his anyway, um, just as an actor and director and a producer, uh, but I don't know him personally, so it's always great to have people who do know him to go in and do the ask, and I have to give a lot of thanks to Deanna Cohen with the uh, Plastic Pollution Coalition. They're based in Los Angeles, and Tim has been one of their, you know, spokespeople against plastic pollution. And she just kind of put it out there to him and he said, yes. And that was really great. Uh, I had a, interestingly enough, how timing works. My editing assistant here in North Carolina had just moved to LA like three weeks before. And he was able to go to Tim's house and record it, the, the narration there. So yeah, we really are grateful for that. Ah, oh, very cool. And then I have a couple little um, tidbit stories. Um, so let's see, back when your film was here, I feel like it must have made an impact here because I feel like it was very soon after that that I started seeing changes around Sonoma Valley. Like there's, there's restaurants that are now using um, plant-based straws that feel like uh, the straw you're used to, but they're biodegradable. Uh -huh. um, people have been giving out paper straws. People have now been asking permission to give you a straw or, or even not asking at all, and you you just have to ask to see if they have them or not, um, which is so funny too, because now I feel kind of taboo. So if I ask for the straw in a place, I'm, I already know the answer. So where I get my straws, I know they're already the biodegradable or paper ones, but people look at you and I'm like, no, I know these straws are okay here. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. And then um, the next year or two after your so I guess it would be just the next year so the next year um I ran into Steve Shore who's from Sonoma International Film Festival and he was drinking with his own uh steel straw that he brought with him and I said I have one of those too it's because of a movie called Straws and he said I produced that film <laughs> so that was a fun moment <laughs> uh-huh <laughs> <laughs> And then um, yeah, Steve, Steve was the um, the idea guy behind the film. He basically just said it because I worked at Sonoma International Film Festival as the director of operations for two years. And um, 2015, Steve was at the festival was over, and he's like, "Hey, I have two documentary film ideas for you." I'm like, "Okay, <laughs> I'm listening." And uh, one of them was pop up restaurants, I think, and the other one is, and he just said one word: straws. Um, if you know Steve, it's like, he didn't really expand. He's just like straws. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And then I'm like, oh, I'm like, duh, you know, we, you know, we were, we used to hike in the, you know, the trails and see all this plastic litter and like, you know, as both of us loving environmental films and really, you know, wanting to program a lot of those at, at Sonoma, it was like, yeah, this is interesting because nobody had really focused on that one topic. You know, at that time there were a lot of bands on, uh, or, either in place or, or talked about, about plastic bags and plastic bottles. Um, but that one single use item, straws, really hadn't come to the forefront of anyone's attention yet. And so um, for that reason, I thank Steve for being the spark of that idea and then me kind of, you know, taking it and, and getting the film done. And then my third story leads into the question. Um, so then, was it last year? It's time, time moves so funny right now. So I think it was last year. Um, I was traveling with a rugby team who was in um, a tournament of finals um, for USA Rugby. And we were in Texas. And I walked up to get a soda or something. And um, the guy threw a straw in the drink. And I looked at it. And I said, I didn't ask for that. He says, you're not in California anymore. And so I'm just curious. Oh, um, <laughs> no, he That's says, you're terrible. in Texas now. I'm like, oh no, this is terrible. And I'm not going to say it's the whole state that feels that way, but it did feel like I was on another planet for a minute. And I was just wondering, how much have you seen change since your film and how much do you think is kind of the same? Oh, I think the change has been tremendous. Uh, you know, one of the most rewarding things was in the last few years since the film came out, is seeing the enormity of legislation, not just on the coast, but across the United States. 
um, Dallas, Texas was tremendous in uh, embracing a Strikeout Straws campaign, thanks to their uh, EarthX Film Festival there that really highlighted the straws and used it in schools. And that's another thing that um, I think, you know, it's been really great is how we've been able to take this film out to the educational market and teachers have been using it in classrooms, entire school districts have been buying it for, you know, entire grades and reaching a youth audience. But surprisingly, it works really great for an older audience too. And, and I've had people, you know, from 40s, 50s come up to me and be like, oh my gosh, this changes so much for me. I'm really gonna, and, and it's not just about the straws, and I really do wanna emphasize that for people who haven't seen the film. Um, we, we use that basically as an introductory topic to the enormity of plastic pollution globally in our oceans and world, you know, and on, on land too. Um, anything that ends up in the oceans probably come from a creek or a stream or, you know, or a watershed from anywhere, from inland. I mean, we know that plastic can travel thousands of miles and end up in, in the water. And so I think we, again, we were sort of like right there riding that wave that just, just starting to crest about this awareness about how much plastic exists in oceans. And the year after the film came out, amazing research papers were coming out, you know, everything that was talking about, my gosh, it, 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 it was just overwhelming really to even comprehend. But I love how Jenna Jembeck, um, who's a PhD at University of Athens explains, you have to imagine yourself on a beach and for in front of you is five plastic bags stacked up with plastic debris and garbage. And on every single coastline, people standing end to end, end to end, all around the world and five bags of garbage are going in, you know, like every day that much. And, and it's just like enormous amounts. So, um, it's, it's really been an amazing global movement to, and we're glad that we could just be a small part of that. This is the work of thousands of people really doing this awareness. Yeah. And I'm glad you brought that up because I was just going to bring up that the straw was the catalyst, but it really is about all the pollutions to the oceans. Um, and I have two other thoughts on that. Um, one is we had made such great progress of, um, reusable bags and and charging people for bags to kind of deter them from wanting to use them um now in the pandemic though we're not allowed to bring our own recyclable bags they're now forcing their bags on us so um how badly do you think this has set us back and do you think we'll be able to regain that that progress that we made fairly quickly or do you think this kind of hit a speed bump yeah, it's definitely frustrating. Um, in, in some cases, it's, it's certainly understandable. Um, you know, we kind of talk about there's good plastic and bad plastic. The good plastic is the plastic that's used right now in hospitals saving people's lives that are sick. The bad plastic is that single use plastic item that unfortunately is gonna only get used for maybe seconds to a couple, you know, 15 minutes, thrown away and last for hundreds to a thousand years in our environment. And, and this is, you know, really, again, this is what we want people to take away is that to be thoughtful, to be mindful. You know, it is hard to be pick up or take out. And, and like you said, there's now restrictions, but um, you can always ask. And, and I think it's just like the straw. You just have to say something. Um, if I order takeout, I'm just like, hey, I don't need the plastic cutlery. Please leave that out. Um, you know, there are, in, in every city is different. I mean, th at least in some stores where I live, they're okay with the reusable bags. Um, you'll find that a little more friendly, probably at co-ops and things like that. Um, or I've asked for paper bags, because at least I know that I can reuse or it's gonna biodegrade. Um, if you have a restaurant, this is tough on them. They're all struggling, but just have a conversation. Have you guys thought about maybe switching over to something a little more eco-friendly? You know, I would be willing to pay extra, maybe 50 cents extra a meal if you could use something more like, you know, a cardboard carton or, a, you know, paper or, you know, or not give out the straws or everything. You know, just, I think it's, yeah, it's a setback, but it's momentarily a setback. I do believe that it's frustrating for a lot of us folks who like really were have these habits ingrained in us and then like we're being like, ah, you know, 
will normalize at some point and, and the movement will keep growing and there will be just as much, or if not more, awareness building over time. And on the positive side, in California, we've been seeing commercials for a ban on um, cigarettes and tobacco products. Um, and, and their focus really is on showing you that how when you drop that cigarette, it goes into the gutter, it goes into the stream, it feeds into the ocean, and it's toxic. And um, it's not just litter, it's toxic. So I think I, we're starting to look at all the little things that we can control and how to control them. And I'm sorry if you're a smoker and I'm telling you not to smoke, but it is bad for the ocean. And at least pay attention to what you're doing with your garbage. Yeah, that you know, that is the number one beach litter item and probably the number one litter item, I think, just everywhere, um, certainly for anyone who's done cleanups. Well, heck, all you gotta do is walk down your street and you see it. Um, it's, it's certainly one of my pet peeves. <laughs> but you know, I, as an example though, I had some guys working at the house and um, they smoked. I wasn't thrilled about it, but I'm like, what am I gonna do? You know, it's hard to find good, good workers. <laughs> um, but then unfortunately they left a lot of cigarette butts out in front of my house because I was basically telling them, if you're gonna smoke, please do it out, in front, out in the street. Um, and, but instead of getting angry and, you know, I, what I tried to do instead was like, and I know this is kind of a cliche phrase, a teachable moment, but I was, I was just like, you know what? Um, I really appreciate that you did go away from the house, but unfortunately I found a lot of cigarette butts. Did you know that that's the number one beach litter item? Did you know how many tons end up in the water of oceans every year? Did you know that it's a toxic filter? And instead of like being, you know, <laughs> angry with me, he was like, you know what? I'm really glad you told me all that. We're really gonna be careful about not littering anymore. So I think this is the thing, you know, it's so easy to get upset and people get angry, you know, and they like just want to get in people's faces about this stuff. But really, it's just, if you can just keep your cool and have a conversation, it's so much better. And it can change people's minds. And I think um, what we're ultimately responsible to is for changing the things that we can, hearing, hearing the information, hearing it, not just, you know, listening. Um, and, and changing the things we can, like the metal straws, um, and continuing to look out for other little, just add a little bit every day, and you're already making a huge impact on our world. Well, you know, and, and there's so much you can do, and you know, I could talk for hours about all of this, but you know, I just seen a post I did on, on our Facebook page the other day about cleaning products. Um, you know, you if you, if you kind of think about it, like all these different products, oh, you need a different product for this, you need a different product for that, you need, you know, this is the cosmetic industry as well. Um, if, when you really start reading into it, you can use stuff that you probably already have in your cabinets, like vinegar, baking soda, salt, um, you know, little hydrogen peroxide, and you can clean anything in your house without spending a bunch of money, a bunch of marketing and advertising companies wealthier and companies that unfortunately have do not have great environmental records or product um you know health records in the, you know you're just giving them more money if you keep buying all of those different products now if you're okay with that that's fine you know that's your choice but i know speaking for myself i don't want to keep feeding into a system where what you're really paying for is marketing and advertising and you're using an unhealthy product for your family, your kids, your dogs. Why do you think dogs and uh, have so much cancer? I'm disturbing, but I think if you look at all the ingredients and what's in your cabinets, if you can't pronounce it, it probably means it's not a really good thing. <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so let's now end with talking about your new documentary short called Lumberton. Yeah. And um, really quickly, I think this is a good film also uh, for people in the Bay Area because, you know, we're going through a lot right now. I'm hoping by the time that this airs that we'll have things more under control. But for now, it's, it's a little out of control and it's a little too familiar to us here. Um, so your documentary, and it's about a specific disaster, but it's one that is a repeat disaster. And so I think that's where the connection is. But um, why don't you tell us a little bit about the, uh, the, the subject of the film? 
Yeah, so Lumberton is a small town here, um, about an hour from where I live uh, in North Carolina, in eastern North Carolina. Um, it's, it's located in probably the poorest county in our state. Uh, it also has a huge population of American, uh, Native Americans um, and African Americans and Latinos. Um, this is a familiar sort of diversity in the economic situation in a lot of small towns in the United States. And um, unfortunately, like a, not, a lot of other small towns with similar uh, situations, it often gets overlooked or um, ignored when you know, there are people that really could use assistance. And in this case, we're talking about a town that has been hammered by flooding, um, very, very, uh, you know, catastrophic flooding in the last few years by two different storm systems related to our climate change. And, and, and I, we found um, a woman, her name is Pat Fox, and her daughter that were homeless twice in two years, um, in particular, uh, disturbing because they just finished renovating the house and moved back into it when it got flooded out again. Um, and the other part of that story is that it could have been that flood water could have been mitigated by some floodgates, but because of a, a corporation that was unwilling to listen to advisement and um, uh, other, you know, government officials and, and citizens urging them to do something, they ignored the problem. So uh, that, let's get diving in a little deep on this. But the other part of it that I really wanted to kind of shed a light on was just these kids in Lumberton were out of school for five to eight weeks at a time. And this, this, you know, this kept, and again, yes, look what we're looking at now. I mean, I could have never have imagined when we were filming Lumberton that that situation would be happening nationally and for a much longer amount of time. And, you know, we were looking at, well, how does this affect kids when they're, you know, they're homeless and they're, they're not, they're displaced, they're not in schools, they're not with their teachers who care about them. And how is that affecting them? And of course, now we're looking at an entire country that is dealing with that situation. Right. And it, it just reminded me something that our youngest said the other day, because she remembered um, during the fires of 2017, I had mentioned, um, you know, we don't have snow days here. When I was growing up, we had earthquake days or flood days occasionally, but um, now we have uh, fire fire days, smoke days, where you guys have to stay wow. home for weeks on end, right? And yeah. to them, it's becoming a normal thing, which is really trippy to me. And um, the fact that she quoted it, and then now we're in COVID days, according to her. And what struck me was there was a girl in your film who had said, you know, growing up there, and even in the last 10 years before the first flood, um, she didn't remember any of this. And that struck me because I've been saying that about our fire seasons. Um, when I was growing up here, I don't remember having a fire season. And I interviewed a firefighter for my, um, my kid show that's also on KSBY. And she said, you don't remember it because it's new. And, um, we had flooding, but it was sort of kind of like a 20 year flood. So I remember there was a bad one when I was little and there was a bad yeah. one recently. Um, and, and same situation. Now they've just finished rebuilding their homes that were lost in the flood. And now they're looking at a fire, just a hill over from them. So um, it's, that just struck me just because, you know, the world has changed so much. It almost feels like the world is angry at us. Well, I, Thankfully, there's a lot more open-mindedness in the walls that come down around the conversation of this enormity of, of these super storms and these weather incidents. And it's, it's like a discussion around climate change is not what it was, you know, 10, 20 years ago. Um, you know, when we were talking about, this is kind of coming full circle back to the beginning of our conversation about industrial hemp being grown as a way to really be part of a solution that could help with CO2 levels globally. I mean, people, you know, thought we were, you know, you're just the usual nut cases, you know? And, and believe me, I'm, I'm like the unlikely filmmaker for a lot of these films, because a, a lot of people would meet me would think, you're not, you don't really fit the stereotype of somebody who's raging about it, you know, 10 years ago. But, but, but here's the thing, you know, after interviewing so many international experts on this topic. It was just unbelievable that we weren't talking about this more. 
now that we can grow it here in the United States, I really hope that we can look at hemp beyond CBD products. Um, we need to diversify the markets. We need to support farmers. We need those investors in wanting to build the processing plants in regions where in industrial hemp, when I say industrial hemp, I mean for fiber and food and, you know, and not for CBD, that's fine. We're, you know, but we really need to expand the market like it is in China, like it is in Europe, and like it is in our neighbors in North Canada. And because hemp absorbs four times more carbon than trees. And also these products like hempcrete buildings continue to absorb carbon and they use less energy. And even building materials itself are a huge contribution to CO2, just the production of those. So it's, a, it's, it's like, if people can just start connecting these dots um, and using things like the hemp farming, like hemp industries and other great sustainable energy solutions and, and looking at our own habits, I mean, this is all what we're gonna have to do. And I'm really just grateful that there's a lot more politicians now and a lot more leaders and a lot more organizations and individuals taking it seriously. And, and I, I just, I do hope that we can turn this ship around, May, you know, because it is people living with these natural disasters year after year after year. It's, it's sad. It's sad. And it takes a toll to not just on the youngsters. I, um, I have two relatives, not to switch the story back on me again, but just in the current situation, I have two relatives where they're both in the evacuation zone mandatory and one refused to leave. And the other one said, um, I, I know my house will be okay because God can't hate me enough to lose my house in two separate disasters. And it just, it's heartbreaking to hear that stuff. And back to the family that you were filming in the short, um, I was going to ask you how you were there so quickly because it looked like you were there in the thick of it. And then I realized, oh, you live there <laughs> in North yeah, Carolina. So you Lumberton's only like an hour and a half yeah. away from Wilmington. Uh, so we just... We kind of felt an urgent need, Blair and I, again, um, as, as, as filmmakers, to, to try to do something to give back to a North Carolina community. Um, we certainly have a lot of our own issues here in Wilmington, but again, L Lumberton's a small town that kind of has been overlooked a lot of times. And um, I am happy to report that Pat did get eventually her approval for <laughs> getting oh, good. her house. Yeah, um, you know, lifted is the proper word. I know there's another term for it, I can't think of it right now. Um, but it's... <laughs> I'm like, I, anyway. I can't help, I don't know. <laughs> I know, I know, I just went blank. Huh? <laughs> but, um, but that's good news, that's great news. It's good news, but there's too many people in her situation that are, like, it's just so hard to go through the hoops and all the the paperwork and the, 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 the agencies and, oh my gosh, I mean, these people really need advocates working for them. Um, they really need caseworkers in a way to, to, to walk them through a lot of this. It's, it's cause it's, it's very uh, confusing and difficult for a lot of people. Yeah. And I'm happy you brought that up, the advocates, because there was one in your film and I was thinking to myself, well, I wouldn't know to ask for that either. So it is really important to have people out there in the disasters telling people what their options are because, um, you know, she's, she's now on the second one and she's just learning that she had some options available to her. Yeah. And, you know, do we just have to get, we have to do better by people. Um, and we also have to build safe housing for people too. And I think that's a, obviously another national problem in so many of our, our towns and cities is that too many people are living in, in unsafe conditions. So when these, these systems are coming through or fires or anything, it's just, they don't have a fighting chance with what they're living in. I mean, every time, it's, you know, it's just heartbreaking. Every time I see these mobile homes completely destroyed by the tornadoes, it, it's just, I don't want people living them in anymore, but unfortunately that's all some people can afford. And again, I think this is where we can come up with, <laughs> I hate to say it, <laughs> hempcrete housing, <laughs> which we could be growing um, and, and 100, you know, 150, 90 days crops, you know, a couple acres building a 1200 square foot house, just like that. Yeah, yeah. 
And you mentioned a few minutes ago connecting the dots, and I think your films are part of the dots that we're connecting. So I applaud you on creating these films. And we've been talking to Linda Booker, who is a documentary filmmaker. Um, she did Bringing It Home, Straws, and recently Lumberton. And I know that Bringing It Home is on YouTube. How can people find the other two? Will the short be available? Uh, Lumberton is free to view as well. Um, just and or Lumberton, Linda Booker, or Lim I think that might be Linda Royal, my new married name. <laughs> yeah, then, I was wondering about that too. Did you get married? Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. It's been two and a half years now and yeah. um, it's going great. Awesome. <laughs> yeah, happy to report. Um, and then uh, Straws, you can watch at home. You can stream it. Uh, if you go to strawsfilm.com, uh, bring it home. As you said, it's on YouTube. Um, you can either just Type in bringing it home or bring hemp home and the entire 54 minute film is there free to watch. And uh, yeah, and I'm just uh, excited that I've been working with some folks here in North Carolina on growing hemp for fiber for textiles because we have a history of the textile industry here in the South, but we're, you know, a lot of people are hoping we can revive a little bit and create these jobs and, and make a, a, a more eco-friendly fabric from and, and locally resourced um, crops instead of our, a t-shirt traveling 13,000 miles <laughs> from China and back here. Right. Like, it'd be great if we could just really get the American textile industry boosted again. Oh yeah, totally amazing and an all new product and good for the environment. Yeah, and um, I know I could go on and on, but I think a lot of people don't realize that so much of the clothing that they're wearing is plastic. <laughs> uh, you know, it's it's not going to biodegrade. All that synthetic uh, polyester and a lot of the nylons and all that, it's, it's plastic fiber. Um, Just like your house wants to breathe, your clothes do too. <laughs> yeah, and I notice a huge difference between wearing cotton or linen or hemp versus um, interestingly, you know, they say it's breathable and everything, less athletic wear, but I'm like, yeah, but at what cost? I mean, we're, we're really, again, contributing funds to the petroleum industry, the more we buy synthetic fabrics. So again, just saying, <laughs> there's, there's a price for everything if, if you care, <laughs> you know, and it's just, uh, uh, but thank you, Kat, so much for inviting me and, um, I appreciate you you're listening to all my, my talking points so politely. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love it. You could talk to me anytime. And listeners, you. if you want to check out our films, in less than two hours, you will have so much knowledge. So I suggest you do so. And then um, do you have a website, lastly, that you want to give out? Oh, gosh, you know, it's in development. Uh, you know, it's always my things that get back burnered, of course. But yeah, I hope to have a By the Brook Films website very soon. My company is by the Brook Productions. Uh, but in the meantime, you can just, you know, search on my film titles and, and you can find everything pretty fast. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you so much. And I'm wishing your household healthiness and we'll all get through this together. Same to you and all everyone in Sonoma in the listening area. I love, uh, I love Sonoma. I miss it. I met the nicest people there. It made me feel really at home. And I really can't wait to get back someday and visit again soon. Awesome. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> All you. right. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye now. Take care.